My name is Sakshi Babar, and I'm affiliated with uh, GD Goenka University in Gurgaon, and I'm also one of the instructors for MET Online for the course Machine Learning. Today, what I'm going to talk on is my preliminary research that, I do, uh, that I'm doing in epidemic detection, and that too using machine learning models. So let me tell you, this, this concept of integrating machine learning models for epidemic detection, it's not new. It's been a lot of studies which, are, which has been done in this domain. But um, the key difference, what I'm going to talk on today, is uh, the methodology that I have taken in order to detect uh, epidemics using Bayesian networks. So I will quickly go, go through the, uh, the outline of the talk. So I divided the talk into five different phases. In the first step, I'm going to introduce you all what is this problem and wherein uh, the machine learning models can fit in in this particular domain. In the second stage, I'm going to talk about some key concepts of epidemics, just for your introduction. What are the challenges in epidemic? What are the phases which epidemic takes? And then I will come back, uh, come to the uh, machine learning model, which I'm going to use for epidemic detection. And that is uh, the third phase, which is Bayesian network. So I'm going to talk also on uh, what Bayesian network is, very brief introduction, and then how Bayesian network can be exploited the Bayesian structure, the causal structure that the Bayesian network captures in order to reveal uh, the patterns which could be very similar to when the epidemic spreads occurs. The next stage will be, uh, I will be discussing in detail what is my methodology of using Bayesian network for epidemic detection. And lastly, I'm also going to discuss some of my preliminary results that I've achieved. So let's start. Now introducing you all to the problem. Now, this problem is basically related to the um, healthcare sector, and that too, it addresses the key challenge of epidemic detection. Now, epidemic detection is a very challenging problem for two main reasons. The one reason is, epidemic can occur anytime, and it can occur anywhere, right? So, seeing those challenges, uh, and the key property of epidemic is that there could be an epidemic which we have seen earlier, or maybe they have, we have a history where we have seen how the epidemic spreads and what are the key patterns of that particular epidemic takes. And the second challenge is uh, sometimes the epidemics can be new, something which we, which we don't know, the, even the healthcare professional doesn't know, and they have a kind of a spread in the community and thousands of you know, lives are in question. So these are the two challenges uh, uh, when we talk about epidemic. So the model that I'm going to talk on basically can deal with something which has happened in the past and can predict that whenever the epidemic is going to come. And also, secondly, if, if we modify the model a little bit, it can also detect uh, the incoming patients, the patterns of the incoming patients, to reveal if something suspicious is going on. In that case also, this particular model, the one I'm going to propose, uh, is going to raise an alarm. Third important thing is, uh, when we talk about epidemics, uh, the government is kind of responsible of you know, making the appropriate preparedness of there could be an epidemic, how to deal with it. When I say government, that means uh, we need to prepare the hospitals, we need to prepare the doctors, we need to prepare the nurses, so as to stop the epidemic strip so that it doesn't spread much and we can save 1,000 lives. Now, in order to do that, uh, the key point is we have to timely detect the epidemic and we need a model which can describe that what are the, what are the patterns we are seeing in the patients, for what reason we are seeing it's an epidemic. I will explain you what I mean by timely detection and I will explain you what I mean by description of the patterns in the upcoming slides. And the model that uh, I'm going to use here, it's for a chikungunya virus. So chikungunya, we all know that it happens every year and thousands of people are, you know, affected by this, this particular virus. But as I said, this model which is being proposed can be extended to any epidemic, uh, more or less any epidemic that uh, we have seen in the past or probably with something which we don't know. Right. Now, um, just a general introduction about epidemic. So epidemic is a disease which we say that it spreads to a thousand, it impacts to a thousand of people. Right? And the, they have a very unique patterns. And whenever it spreads, it is about the, most of the population is affected by that. So in uh, general, we have these uh, epidemics uh, nowadays. The one is uh, Nipah virus, which recently happened in Kerala, 
and you know, thousands of lives were affected. Second is influenza. This is an epidemic in which the population faces a lot of rep respiratory problems. Next one is a mosquito borne diseases, which, which comes in like, for example, chikungunya, dengue. And nowadays we have a Zika virus, which says that it may infect, it may impact the newborn babies. So we have a lot of things which are coming up because of this mosquito borne diseases. And another threat is a trick borne diseases. These are new epidemics which are raising up. So the idea of this talk is that can, how, can we somehow uh, detect these epidemics, the spread by any of them, using machine learning models. So, so first, let's, let's try to understand what is the framework of epidemic. So W Health Organization says that epidemic typically follows the four different stages. The first stage is of epidemic preparedness, where we say that, okay, we are preparing for the possibility of epidemic, and that is concerned with the um, necessary resources that we require in the hospital. And this preparedness steps comes from what you have seen in the history, right? So based on the history, we are actually preparing the hospital for the uh, enough resources, or say, for example, enough equipment or the domain experts, so that whenever the epidemic spread is there, we are prepared enough to deal with it. The second step is surveillance. This is a step in which we are basically monitoring the, uh, the records, or we say the patterns or the symptoms of the patients which, which is coming to the hospital, and based on those symptoms and, uh, symptoms and the patterns, the objective is to find out what is the probability of the epidemic based on what we have seen in the history. So this is an area which, the surveillance, this is an area in which uh, the machine learning models can be used in order to detect the epidemics. The third phase is confirmation and assessment, which is basically, if, if we say that, okay, there is a probability that the epidemic is going to be uh, in this particular community, then what is the confirmation do we have? So confirmation is always possible when we go for the lab results, lab test, and it confirms that, okay, there could be a chance of some epidemic. So but the question is, before even going to the lab results, can we timely detect epidemic? And if at all we can timely detect it, can we take an appropriate action so that it doesn't spread as much? So that's an idea. The last stage of an epidemic is uh, the control and documentation, where we say that, OK, this time epidemic has been, has been there in the community, and what necessary documentation, how it was spread, where it was caused, all those documentation will be collected. Now the output of the last stage becomes the input of the first stage, where we start, again, the preparedness of the outbreak, and then monitoring, surveillance, and then confirmation of the lab results, and this process goes on. So the, the key thing is, Every time, seeing the history, we have to be better prepared so that we can stop the epidemic whenever it's spreading. Right. Now, there are four key challenges in output detection. The first is early detection. Early detection means whenever the records are coming, we are analyzing the patterns, and how early we can say that, the, okay, this is the probability or this is a chance that there could be epidemic. And the second one is predicting the nature of the virus. Is it a new virus or it is a virus we already know, right? Third one is measures of control, that how I'm going to stop the further spread. Can I take the appropriate measures timely? And the fourth one is maintaining the adequate medical facilities. Uh, the focus of this talk is the first one, which is early detection, and that to integrating the machine learning models. So when, uh, according to W Health Organization, we declare an epidemic if either of the two, when the two of the conditions are satisfied. The first condition is we are somewhere sure, we have a high probability that there could be an epidemic. That's an early detection. And the next phase will be we are confirming through the lab results that there is a spread. And whenever we have a, uh, things like step number one and step number two, we raise an alarm that, OK, there could be an epidemic, and we need an appropriate preparedness for that particular disease. Uh, the first step is known as early recognition or early detection. We are not saying we are detecting. We are saying we are early detecting the possibility of disease. Um, now the major question, the objective of the talk. So can I somehow, uh, we can integrate the machine learning models in the surveillance framework in order to detect the epidemiology in better time or better in less number of days. 
As an example, suppose uh, there is a probability that we see a lot of patients coming with some key patterns, right? If we keep on uh, taking those patterns, analyzing it, and we declare the epidemic in four days, let's say, for example, seven days of time, it's already spread, right? And if it's already spread, uh, lots of thousands of lives will be in question. So the idea is, can I declare the epidemic in, say, for example, 24 hours or 48 hours? So the action from the government agency starts. So here is where uh, the machine learning model, the integration of machine learning model is being proposed to early detect uh, the records. Um, the methodology which is followed in this work is very similar to what we do in any kind of a machine learning model. The first step would be, I will be collecting the data, right? Second step would be, uh, make the machine learning model from that data. And the model that I've, I've used in this work is Bayesian network. Why Bayesian network? I will come to that point. Third one is, um, once the model is ready, I will exploit the causal structure that the, that particular Bayesian network says. And based on the causal structure, I will tell that, okay, these, are, these could be the common cause-effect relationship, which you can see when a person is suffering from an epidemic. And the last one is, uh, now the question is, I have a trained Bayesian network based on the historical data. Now the new inpatient uh, symptoms are coming up. And now based on the new data that I'm receiving, I need to find out if there's a chance of epidemic or there is no chance of epidemic. And the last one is, if at all, uh, we find that, okay, these patterns are something very similar to what, has, what we have seen in the history, we will declare an alarm. And this all steps, as I said, this is on early detection and nowhere else. So little introduction about uh, Bayesian networks. So Bayesian networks is a kind of a probabilistic graphical models, uh, which captures the domain knowledge in the form of a cause-effect relationships, right? So we say Bayesian network is a kind of a causal model where my domain knowledge is uh, represented in the cost-effect relationship and the strength of the causal uh, relation is represented by probability. So we, we say that the Bayesian network is not only capturing your domain knowledge in the causal structure, but it is also describing uh, what is the probability of that particular event which is represented in a cause-effect relationship to happen, right? So everything is represented in the form of a, every event is represented in the form of a probability. So there are two things now. One is Bayesian network, which talks about the causal structure, the domain knowledge. And the second is it takes up the, uh, everything represented there in the form of a probability. Now, as an example, this is a very popular Bayesian network, which we uh, see a lot of there in the literature as well. So this is a simple Bayesian network, which is Asia Bayesian network. And this Bayesian network basically captures that whenever uh, the person visits Asia, and these are the various uh, causes which we have, and this, these are the various effects that a Bayesian network is telling that particular patient may have. As an example, it says that uh, there's a variable visit to Asia. It is uh, affecting tuberculosis. It says that whenever the patient, whenever a person visits Asia, what is the probability that it will have tuberculosis or it will not have a tuberculosis? So based on the history, we say that, okay, there is a causal relationship. Whenever a person visits Asia, they might have tuberculosis. Similarly, as an example, smoking is influencing lung cancer. So if the person smokes, what is the probability that the person will have lung cancer? So they are all causal structure, which is uh, represented in this particular graph. So, um, the causal structure basically um, is being drawn with the direction of the arrow. So we say the one which is on the top, uh, from where the direction is starting, we say that these are the causes, and uh, where they're ending on the variable, we say that's an effects. Now, when we talk about uh, Bayesian network, it has two major components. The first component is qualitative component, another is quantitative component. Qualitative components basically uh, tells what is the variables of interest of that particular domain, and uh, what is the causal structure of that particular, uh, that particular problem. So as an example here, um, first step of making the Bayesian network was identifying the different variables, and the second step was making the causal structure between those variables, right? Once we have that, that finishes the qualitative part. The next part would be quantitative part, which basically details what is the probability of two events occurring together. So here, what we see in the bars in the figure 
it says that what is being represented is the prior probability of that particular variable, right? So we have, it says the probability is that the person visits to Asia is one person. Probability that the person doesn't visit, visits Asia is 98%, right? So this will affect the tuberculosis. And what you see here in present and absent is, again, the prior probability in tuberculosis. So once you do some kind of a reasoning in Bayesian network, it will tell you what are the probability of that particular event to happen. As an example, so these are the different inferences or reasoning which are possible in a Bayesian network. So once we have a model ready, probability is ready, the next would be that we can exploit the Bayesian structure based on the reasoning that we, we are interested in. So Bayesian network supports three kinds of reasoning. The first is a causal one, which goes in direction of the arrow. Second is diagnostic one, which goes against the direction of the arrow. And the third one is intercausal reasoning. As an example, suppose I'm interested in finding, uh, I know that the per person doesn't smoke, smoking is false. What is the probability that the x-ray will be true? This is a causal inference because what I'm giving is the causes which are, uh, which are in the direction, which are following the direction of the arrows, and I'm interested in finding the probability of x-ray. Similarly, diagnostic reasoning, as I said, it goes uh, backwards from effects to causes. So I can, in, I can imply this kind of reasoning in the Bayesian network. And let me give you a solution like something like this. I know the uh, x-ray is true. Bronchitis is true. What is the probability that the person doesn't smoke? So these kind of a reasoning can be employed of Bayesian network. And uh, any kind of a probabilistic query can be answered. Um, why I have chosen Bayesian network for this work? First, first primary reason is the Bayesian networks are intuitive. Intuitive in the sense that all my domain knowledge, I can see that in the form of a graph. What I just need to do is, I need, just need to play with the inferences, and it can tell me the probability of any event to occur, no matter it's a diagnostic, no matter it's a causal. Second most important reason of choosing the Bayesian network is that uh, Bayesian network is about my belief on that particular domain, right? Uh, it means that no matter I have a data, I don't have a data, being a domain expert, I can still make a Bayesian network, right? So it is not limited to the presence of the data that I should have. But of course, if we, if we have a data, it's a good thing. But if we don't have a data, Bayesian says it's my belief. What do you see based on a domain expert or experiences the model should look like, right? Third important thing choosing the Bayesian network is we can predict the event with the probability. That means Bayesian network somehow is capturing the uncertainty that governs your uh, domain. Second is, we can describe what is the problem, right? So when, my, uh, when we see machine learning models, nowadays it's more, uh, more important to find out the description than prediction. We, we know that, okay, this is going to happen. But the first uh, logical question that comes to our mind is, why we are saying that this is going to happen? So if we, if we need such kind of a description, we can go back to the Bayesian model, and it can explain that, OK, this kind of a thing is not supported in a Bayesian common knowledge. And that is the reason uh, your prediction is made like that. right? So Bayesian network can explain what is there in your domain knowledge. Um, that's why it's descriptive in nature. It's predictive in nature. And the lastly, as I said, it's a white box model. You can get an explanation to everything that you want based on the reasonings that it supports. Now. <clears throat> So Bayesian networks are supported in uh, different forms. We have Netica, we have Hugin, which supports Bayesian network learning and inferencing, right? So all you need to do is, if you have your domain experts, you can make a Bayesian model and you can do the inferences. If you don't have that, you have the data, you can still learn the Bayesian network using such kind of tools like Netica and Hugin, right? So we have libraries in R as well. It's B and Learn and Deal. They are very popular libraries by which you can make the Bayesian models and we can uh, inference around it as well. Uh, we have libraries in Python as well. So BasePy, Pomegranate is one of the examples. And now, nowadays, uh, these uh, things like uh, Edward and Stan, they're becoming popular for probabilistic inference. Because the problem with the Bayesian network is when your data set grows, number of variables grows, your causal structure becomes dense. Inferencing is a problem, right? So nowadays, they have a, a probabilistic languages, for example, Stan and Edward, which takes your data to, the, say, for example, TensorFlow, and they can do the reasoning very fast. So these are the libraries which, which can help us doing that. But the model that uh, is proposed in this work 
it's a very small model with few limited variables. Uh, so the, these libraries were not used. I stuck to Netica as well as, and uh, be alone to do all my inferencing task. <clears throat> so as I said, uh, I'm going to address the problem of chikungunya virus uh, based on Bayesian network. So now onwards, I'm going to detail you what methodology I took in order to predict chikungunya and how I did that. Um, since I'm going to use Bayesian network, the first thing I require is the uh, variables, right? So what are the different variables which are of kind of an interest whenever we talk about chikungunya, right? So what I did is I divided those variables into four parts. The first set of variables were environmental features. Environmental features means, if at all, there has to be a chikungunya. There has to be an appropriate environment in order, in order to virus to grow. And that particular environment is based on the weather conditions, the temperature, the rainfall. These are all environmental variables, which basically makes the trend in the symptoms of the patients. Right? That's a one part of the uh, features. The second set of features are independent features. Independent features, I took two variables here. One is region, another is date. Region I took because I, was, uh, I wanted to do, see that which region is basically becoming probable for chikungunya disease, right? Uh, date, what date uh, the chikungunya virus, we, we have started seeing the patients with some symptoms. Next is response features. Response features basically are the features which uh, chikungunya patients should have. Say, for example, rashes, high fever, body ache. These are the features which Commonly, more or less, we see whenever we have a patient with chikungunya. And the last one is decision feature, which is alert. Alert means that, okay, we, have, we, have, we are observing kind of a symptoms in patients now, and it's time to raise an alarm. And once the alarm is raised, the lab process will start on, and the preparedness accordingly will be start. So these are the four set of features that were required uh, when I started with the building the patient network. Once I've identified the various features, the next step was uh, to make the causal structure, right? So here, what you see in this model is how um, things are described in a cause-effect relationships, right? So these are all variables that I have. So top one here are the all environmental variables. We have temperature, rainfall, humidity, and all lower middle, middle layer is basically all the symptoms that we see in the patients. And the last one is an action node, which basically is an alert that when do we need to start alerting the uh, government sector that, okay, there could be a chance of epidemic. And there are two, one independent node there, one is region, which doesn't have anything to do about uh, the symptoms in the patients. But this, this variable is required so as to identify which particular region is getting affected. That's why this, this, this particular variable is sitting here. Okay, so once we have this causal structure, we have the various variables ready. The next step was to learn the probabilities, to learn the association between the two different parameters. So based on some experience, uh, why I will, tell, why I will, I will just say, tell you that why I'm saying it's an experience. But for now, um, these are the different variables, these are the different probabilities that we have for this particular model. And what you see for every, every bar, for yes or no, these are the prior probabilities. Right? So once we have done with this learning the Bayesian network model, the next step was to exploit this Bayesian structure in order to see if the patients that, if the symptoms is that we are seeing today has something to do with the history that we've already seen. Right? So now the thing is, once I have this Bayesian structure ready, my uh, next thing was I needed the data set. Why I'm seeing the data set? Because in medical domain, getting the real data set is a problem. I do, I, 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 I'm not sure if I can go to the hospital and get the chikungunya data set, right? It's a, it's a long process. So first I did was I simulated the data sets from this model, this model, by setting the different environmental variables, because as I said, environmental variables are those variables which is going to set a trend inside the symptoms, right, for the symptoms. So the next step was simulating the data set. I, um, and those were simulated by setting the environmental variable. As an example, I said that today uh, the temperature is very high, and I simulated the data set, right? And I set uh, the, uh, this variables for all the environmental variables I have, and based on those setting those variables, I simulated some of the data set. And those data sets were used uh, to um, 
kind of use this particular model for evaluation purposes, right? I will detail you on that as well. So, so far um, in this phase, we have the Bayesian network ready. We have the data set ready. Now what, what we need to do is we need to uh, see the records of the patients which are coming in now and see if we can early detect the uh, chikungunya virus. Now, um, let's study, uh, let's say that it's a current day and I'm receiving the records of the patients. I'm on the end of the day and a lot of records were collected by the patients. And uh, these are, I just said that today, say for example, is 23rd of uh, this uh, June, year 19. And today temperature is high, rainfall is high, humidity is high. And these are the example uh, patient record that I will receive that. Okay, so these are the features of the uh, features and the patient one record and patient two record. This is what I have today. And based on what I have today, I need to identify if this carries a patterns which is there in the history. <clears throat> so once I have uh, the data of the current day, what methodology I took was I mined high support, high confidence rules from the Bayesian network based on setting the environmental variables and the decision node, right? So what is high support, high confidence rules? It says that in order to understand that, let's first understand what is the meaning of a support in Bayesian framework and what is the meaning of confidence in Bayesian framework. So support and confidence, they are both coming from association rule mining. The definition for them are more or less the same. But the support, uh, as an example, this is a Bayesian network which is given to us. And I'm interested in finding the support of the variable C. Support of a variable C is the probability in that particular variable. And support is always applicable for the parent node. We cannot have a support for the child node. For the child node, we will have the confidence, and that confidence is nothing but the conditional probability given the evidence on the parent node. Right? So as an example, um, as an example, uh, suppose um, this is the support for temperature is equal to high. I want to find out the support for temperature is equal to high. This is coming out to be 40% based on the Bayesian network. And the second uh, thing I'm interested in, I want to find out uh, that I know fever is high. That is what the, this particular, in the middle, you can see that the high is 100% now. That means we are setting that particular variable with that particular value. So now we know the fever is high. What is the probability that the headache will be low? So this is a confidence in, in this particular variable, which is headache. And this is coming out to be 80%. So we, this, we have this confidence value for headache is equal to low based on support which is given by uh, the parent node, which is, say, for example, temperature here. Now, given this definition of support and confidence, uh, we mined uh, high support, high confidence rules uh, by considering all the causal frameworks that we have in the Bayesian network. From all the causal frameworks, I mean that all the cause-effect cause relationships that are represented in the Bayesian network, we mined high support, high confidence rules and based on those rules, if those rules were the part of the symptoms that we see today, we will say that, okay, more or less, there is this much probability that there could be a chance of epidemic. Uh, this rule is basically when it says the probability, the support is greater than max support, and uh, confidence is greater than max conf. This is a rule that is going to be applicable for each causal structure that I have for Bayesian network we are going to get some patterns or rules. And those rules will look like something like this. A implies B, say for example, they are more or less the same as the station rule mining. And A, uh, B implies C, right? So as an example, suppose um, I have set the values of environmental variables here. I know the temperature is very high, rainfall is very high, humidity is high, and there is no alert. In the, in the past, there is no alert. Then what are the high support, high confidence rules? So it says that the first high support, high confidence rule is that fever is high, cold is yes, headache has to be high. That is a one rule that is applicable when there is no alert, because alert is set to no. Similarly, second uh, rule is uh, fever is high, rash is no, and that is the reason there is no alert. So these are the patterns that we can mine from every, every causal structure that is represented or uh, captured in the Bayesian network. Right. 
So what we need to do is we need to see that if uh, these high support, high confidence rules are present in today's uh, data that we are receiving, if at all we are, receive, we are seeing that lots of patients are coming with high support, high confidence rules, then we may say that, okay, there could be a um, chance that there could be a prediction, and if at all, uh, there could be an epidemic, and we will keep on observing the data for the next day and see how the patterns goes. Now, it is very important to see if uh, statistically what number we are saying is actually matching with what, what is there in the history. So uh, say, for example, this table basically represents that we have one uh, uh, pattern here. Fever is yes, and joint pain is yes. So in the baseline, we have 26 features with that pattern. And in the recent day, we have 10. Similarly, the, uh, the patients with not these symptoms, in the baseline, we have 120. And uh, in the recent day, we have 20. So we uh, do the chi-scale test on this in order to see if the, what we are seeing today is actually validated statistically with what we have in the baseline. So we evaluate that, and we get the p-value. If it's greater than 5%, we need to test if it's a significant or it's non-significant. Yeah, so we need to repeat this process of surveillance and keep on doing the same uh, for every patient that are coming to the hospital. So data set, uh, as, I tell, as I told earlier, uh, it was being created by dividing the community by different regions. So we have eight regions defined. And for different region, we have simulated the, have simulated the data set, right? So like, for example, I have a data for north region by setting the environmental variables the data set was simulated, and so on for the eight different uh, regions that is given, uh, that is there in the, in the flaw, in the figure. Um, um, there are three um, this, uh, data sets now. The one is starting from June 1st, and it is ending at two, or oh, there's a long, wrong, it's a typo here. So it's, a, it's stopping at 1st of August, 1st of uh, September, right? So we have three months data collected for year 16. We have three months data collected for 17, and three months data collected for year 18. So the first two data, year 16 and year 17, will go for the training of the Bayesian network, and the rest of the data will be used for the evaluation purpose. One important thing, when we talk about epidemic, it doesn't mean that whenever there's a peak of patients visiting the hospital, that is a reason of epidemic. So as, as represented here in the first plot, that's the statistics for region one for which the data set was simulated. And the attacks were induced somewhere in, uh, I think, week six and seven, right? But week six and seven is not only the hike. They, you can see the hike on 11th week as well. So there are a lot of patients visiting the hospital in week 11 for some reason. Uh, and there are a lot of patients visiting the hospital on week four and week five, right? So the hike necessarily, doesn't necessarily mean that there is an epidemic. And same is true for the uh, statistics for the region two. So here, uh, eight and 10 are uh, the points on which the, there was an epidemic. The epidemic was induced. But uh, there's a, uh, there is a peak in the week three as well. So that means week three, a lot of patients are going to the hospital. But uh, as I said, peak doesn't mean that there could be an epidemic. And the challenge here is if you can discern the patterns of the patients visiting the third week and the patients visiting, say, for example, that week in which there was an epidemic. Okay, so this is a simple example of how the patterns looks like, the, uh, the patient's pattern looked wise looks like when we talk about the data which can be collected on the weeks. So these are the different values that those particular variables can take in. So now uh, what we need to do is, suppose we are on the current day, we set the environmental variables in the Bayesian network, and we have set the alarm as high. So we are, what we are trying to find out is, in the history, when these were the environmental variables, an alarm was raised, what are the high support, high confidence rules that can be mined from the Bayesian network? So once we have this, there could be an example, something like this. So once I set this environmental variables and alert as high, as an example, uh, these are the two patterns that I'm getting. The first is fever is equal to high implies joint pain is equal to has. yes. So this is one pattern. And fever is high, rash is yes is another pattern. So these are the patterns which we get whenever there was alarm in the history with some environmental variables prone to that particular environment to be high. These are the uh, high support, high confidence rules. Now these high support, high confidence rules are to be uh, tested in the data set we have today and to find out 
if there could be a chance in epidemic. So, as, um, so this details the summary of records of the data sets. The first table says that in the baseline, when there was uh, attack, how many cases were there? That is 132 in the baseline. In the recent today means today's data, we have 71. So in the normal records, we have 595. And in the recent, we have 242. So total cases were 727 in the baseline and 313 in the uh, recent today's data. Now, when uh, this high confidence, high rules methodology was employed, this is a result that we get. Uh, so predicted positive came out to be 237, and predicted negative came out to be 68. And there was false positive and false negative as 5 and 3. The accuracy is, it is giving as 97.4. Uh, now, the key question, it's not about the accuracy. We are not predicting it. Important is if you can timely predict it, right? So this, this accuracy is, uh, is, is not that important, but timely prediction is more important. So in order to do that, um, what I did was I analyzed the patient's data week by week, and I compared with the baseline data set. As an example here, it says that there's a day one on the test set. I uh, checked the records of HSSC in the baseline. I compared that with the recent one. And this table um, details that statistics. And that table, uh, table number six, details the summary of the statistics on day two, what's happening today and what happened in the baseline on the, that particular week. So the p-value for this uh, relation is coming out to be 0 0.02. It says it's significant. So that means what you're seeing today, the number of patients which are coming with such cases are significant what has happened in the past. So this is day one data. This is day two data. So based on the day one data and day two test uh, data, we can declare the possibility of epidemic in, 20, in 48 hours. So it's two days. Right? So 48, uh, within 48 hours, you can say that, OK, there could be a probability of uh, chikungunya, which could be there. Now, um, there are a lot of, uh, this is all about uh, the methodology which was being used to detect the epidemic. But uh, this model has a lot of scope to improvement. The first one is, uh, of course, getting the robust Bayesian network, which you can learn from the real data sets. If the hospitals can support in getting the real data sets, we can have more robust uh, probabilistic environment and, of course, the most robust causal structure. And second is um, setting up the more challenging environment, right? And also, I believe the statistical test that is employed here has to be more robust in order to see if this kind of a models are basically can work for uh, real data sets and we can, start, we, we can statistically validate that. That's all. Thank you for your time. And... Uh, I hope I've given you some insights about that. Yeah, so there are some references that I've used here. So this is more of as, this is an ICML paper which is, which is being used as a base for this kind of a work. Thank you. Thank you, Sakshi, for that insightful talk. So we'll open the floor for questions. If anybody has uh, questions for Sakshi, right here. OK. Mike right here? Yeah. Hi. This is Samir here. Yeah. And uh, I have one question, like, uh, how you detect, like, a false positive? False positive, which doesn't have the HSHC uh, patterns. Uh, how you do the causality after that your model predicted something uh -huh. is not there, uh -huh. but uh, later on it found as something is affected? See, it also depends upon what kind of a model you are using. So this model is chikungunya virus, right? And all of us be aware that uh, chikungunya starts uh, with its symptoms in seven days of time. Is it right? Seven days after the patient is going to visit the hospital because after seven days, it's going to show up some symptoms. And it's not the first day that the symptoms will be shown. It, will, it can be third day, it can be fourth day, it could be fifth day, right? So based upon what data we are collecting every day, we are just checking if the HSHC patterns are there in that data, right? Uh, and what are the chances of that particular patient to have uh, the chance of epidemic? But this, 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 uh, the definition of HSHC might change if we try to make a Bayesian model for different kind of a disease. But since chikungunya has a pattern of showing the uh, symptoms is after seven days or even uh, you know two weeks of time, so this. We have a wait time of seven days to analyze the patient data. Thank you. A minimum seven days. Thanks. One more question yeah. I have, like, um, your confidence level, if in case, like, a constant, 
and uh, for giving a support of 0.5 or something. Uh -huh. And uh, if it is a constant for uh, two patients, like a first patient is having confidence level 0.7, second patient is also 0.7, but first patient got detected as a chicken gunia. Now, mm -hmm. what is, th and the second patient does not have. So how your model yeah, will yeah. handle so, so these, these things works on the two parameters, min support and max support, as we have in uh, association rule mining, right? We need to find out what is the best min support threshold and what is the min max support threshold that we are looking for for this kind of a patterns to come out, right? And these kind of uh, parameters needs a lot of robust testing that, okay, based on the history, now we are confident that this has to be threshold, has to be good enough to get the HSHC patterns, right? It's same as what we do in association rule mining, right? In association rule mining, we set up the different parameters and see how, how rules do we get. And if the rules are ma like a large in nature, we set the even more uh, complex uh, values for min support and max support. That's, that's what it, but in this work, it was min support as 40, 40 percent and max confidence as 50 percent. Because here it is a little bit risky on yeah, putting yeah, the is, threshold is, on. Definitely, I agree. That is the reason I said I need a more robust model and more uh, real data set would really help in setting these parameters. Because the moment we said that today, there is uh, this, this year we don't have any epidemic thing or we have an epidemic twice or thrice, we are basically uh, making our model robust, right? Because all the data will go to the learning again. Thank you, so. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, hello. Yeah. Uh, uh, hi, Sakshi. Ajay, Ajay Shivasto here. On this side. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Is there any open data source available for epidemic uh, diseases and um, other things uh, that yeah, we sir, can I've use? I've seen, um, not for chikungunya, because most of the, them are, they simulate. Uh, if at all you have a good contact with the hospital, you may get the real data set. But uh, in Thrix type of diseases, epidemics, we will get, we can get the data online, but that too from, uh, you know, some other countries, not from India. So not from India. No, no. And what other uh, model we can use in epidemic? Uh, other than Bison Network? Mm, decision tree could be a good one. Since my perspective is I don't want prediction, I want the description as well. But since there's a, there's a, the key difference would be that decision tree is going to uh, reveal things based on correlation, right? Okay. But when we talk about Bayesian Network, it's causation. So we are more confident. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. So uh, any more questions? Yeah. Yeah, one more question. So, uh, it's about uh, number of feature selection to come out, uh, uh, run the same data on that. Uh, Sorry, please, can you come again? Yeah, it's about uh, number of feature selection. So, uh, based on your single uh, data run, you uh, uh, listed down all the feature which is sufficient enough for your model or you executed uh, multiple time with the same data set? Um, I executed twice, I think. I executed the t model twice. I relearn it again and again in order to get H HSHC patterns. But as I said, I need the real data set because it, since it's a simulated one, I'm setting the environmental variables, right? But uh, we, uh, we require the real data set for that. But I did the simulation twice. I mean, the ro it was robust uh, training for a Bayesian network to learn the parametric relationship between two features. So for, let's say, if I, uh, I want to work on something, so uh, for that, uh, uh, I just want to make sure whatever feature I'm selecting, that is sufficient enough and that is going to work for yeah. me. So, so, so the my answer to this question is, as I said, Bayesian network is about your belief, right? Now, when, when I am doing this work, I'm believing, it's my belief that chikungunya needs these variable to be tested for, uh, it has to be there, right? It has to be there for no reason else. But since, uh, but when we um, work with the real data sets, features may grow, right? Since I am not consulting for this particular work to any domain expert, it's my belief reading the articles, reading the W Health organization uh, this uh, documentation, it says that the symptoms, this thing are sufficient to deal with detecting the uh, chikungunya, right? But this model can be extended, of course, if you have a real data set and if you have any domain expert which is sitting with you and can say that, okay, if you can extend this model by adding few more features, that would be a good thing. Thank you. Yeah. We have time for one last question. Uh, I wanted to know how would you actually learn the causal structure from a real data set? Okay. So Bayesian network uh, says there are two approaches to learn the causal structure. One is I said that since Bayesian says it's your belief, if I'm the domain expert, I can make the causal structure, right? 
And the second approach would be, uh, since I have the hospital data, which is given to me, uh, based on the data, there are algorithms like we can use, may, may make use of EM and uh, maximization algorithms to actually uh, learn the causal structure. That's the second approach. But that's variational inference, right? We are not learning the cause, causal structure which define what causes and what is the effect. No, those uh, Bayesian uh, learning parameters, Bayesian learning algorithms, basically learn the causal structure. And that's the only model which supports causality. Because Bayesian network is a model which supports the two uh, requirements which we say a causal structure should have. And that's the only model which has. But expected... Expectation maximization expectation is maximization about training, Expectation maximization is for parameter right? learning, and we have a lot of hill climbing algorithms. We have AD trees. We have um, uh, taboo, taboo decision uh, structure learning. We have different algorithms by which the structure can be learned from the data uh, with the aim of causality. Thank you so much. Thank you.